HVAC 360, episode number 35, Non-Chemical Water Treatment Devices. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of HVAC 360. I am your host, Matt Nelson. A show that talks about all the good stuff in HVAC, whether it be people, products, or manufacturers. Uh, So this week we have a special treat. I'm very excited about this. Uh, Non-chemical water treatment devices. Okay, now it sounds a lot more complicated than it is, but we'll get into it. Essentially, it's things that take the place of chemical treatment in, uh, uh, in this case, uh, condenser water systems or, or tower water systems. Today I'm going to be talking with uh, Dr. Janet Stout. She is the uh, Director of Special Pathogens Lab uh, and Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh Swanson School of Engineering. So now she is a clinical environmental microbiologist and uh, really her niche in the market is, uh, uh, you know, she's an authoritative source about uh, Legionella, uh, the bacteria that causes Legionnaire's disease. So she's had about 30 years experience in that, and it's really a pleasure to, uh, to be able to talk uh, with Dr. Stout uh, about uh, this research that she's just done. I mean, this basically, this is kind of uh, springboarded off a, a research project that was funded by ASHRAE that's recently been completed by Dr. Stout, and uh, let's, uh, let's see what she has to say. So let's cut to the tape. <laughs> All right, today we're going to be talking with uh, Dr. Janet Stout. How are you doing this morning, Janet? Terrific, thanks. Hey, now, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Um, Well, it's kind of interesting. I I live in two worlds, really, uh, microbiology and engineering. I have a master's and a Ph.D. in public health microbiology, and I study bacteria that are in water, particularly Legionella bacteria, the cause of Legionnaire's disease. Uh, now what? Now, uh, you know, we were talking specifically about the uh, uh, non-chemical water treatment devices. Um, so, I guess what what was the uh, what was the impetus for this this study that was uh, um, put on by ASHRAE? Non-chemical water treatment devices have been around for a long time, and and we'll talk about the different types that there are. And there's been some discussion about whether or not they are uh, effective in controlling microbial fouling in cooling towers. So the, the objective of the study was to provide a controlled and independent evaluation of these non-chemical treatment devices for controlling um, biological activity in cooling towers. Now, this was funded by ASHRAE, is that correct? That is correct. It, was it completely funded? Uh, well, more or less, you know, when you when you do a research project, and this is done through the University of Pittsburgh at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, uh, you try to budget uh, what you think the cost will be, uh, and that has to comport with what the ASHRAE request for proposal budget is. Um, I'm sure we went over budget, but ASHRAE had a set amount of money that they uh, allowed for the project. So I guess to kind of take me through the process a little bit, you 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 know you're basically selected for to do the perform the study, and what's what's kind of involved once you get that uh, you know uh, that that acceptance letter? I mean, I mean, as, as far as like your involvement with ASHRAE, is there a, a special committee or, or how does that interaction work? Yes, it's a it's a very controlled process actually. Uh, this uh, research project that was funded by ASHRAE came through one of their technical committees. Uh, It's called TC 3.6. It's water treatment. And once the project is funded, then that committee sets up what's called a project monitoring subcommittee. And that was composed of a number of engineers and microbiologists who work very, very closely with the investigators on every aspect of the study. And they also worked very closely with the manufacturers of the non-chemical devices. And in fact, both uh, a representative from the Project Monitoring Committee and uh, the manufacturers were on site during the uh, process of construction and installation of the devices. So let me get this straight. They, the, the actual, the, the people, this was, this, you know, basically the, um, the companies that produce these non-chemical water treatment devices, they were, they were 
integral part of what the process that you were performing. Yes, and I, I think this is a unique and important aspect to the study. Each manufacturer and an ASHRAE committee meet, uh, member uh, came on site, met with us, uh, approved the installation and operation of each device. Uh, so it was a collaborative effort. So exactly when, when, was, the, um, uh, when was the study performed? We, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we started the project in April of 2008, and the beginning of the study was really to get uh, the construction and, uh, and confirm the operation of these model cooling towers. These were fully functioning model cooling towers, and it took about six months or so just to get the, the design uh, approved by the committee. And the completion in terms of uh, submitting the report to the committee was December of '09, so it was a two-year-plus uh, process in terms of the research, and then more months after that for the final approval of the report. And when when was the study published? The study was published in October in the ASHRAE journal HVAC and R Research. Uh, so we were very proud of that, and uh, Scott Duda, the environmental engineering graduate student, was first author on that paper. Now that, and that was the, just this past year in, in 2011, correct? That's correct, yes. Now, I guess, how, how do you get the, uh, your hands on, on, on this paper if you want to be able to, to, to review it? Just... You can get it at our website, uh, specialpathogenslab.com. That's S-P-E-C-I-A-L-P-A-T-H-O-G-E-N-S lab.com. And there's, at the top of the page is a research tab, and uh, you can click on that. Uh, you can also get it directly from HVAC and our research. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that I put that uh, in the show notes so people can uh, to just click on, go to the website and uh, check out the blog and, and, and click on that site. It'll be with the, uh, the posting there. Terrific. So, so now, I guess, uh, describe the, the approved test rigs. I mean, you, you've, you've said they're kind of like, you know, like toy cooling towers, but, I mean, they're fully functional. What, what yes. Uh, for me, as a microbiologist, I thought it was incredible how these were constructed. And I want to give credit to Dr. Rada Salvitic, who's the chair uh, and environmental engineer that uh, oversaw the project. He's the chair of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. He and Scott Duda and some other students were the ones that actually constructed these uh, model cooling towers. And what I mean by they're fully functional is that they have a a specified flow rate, uh, a water temperature drop uh, of about 10 degrees. The air flow rate was about 650 CFM. Uh, it had the same type of packing or fill that a, cool, a large uh, to scale cooling tower would have. And we operated at typical cycles of concentration between four and six, and, and the, the blowdown of the tower was just like it is out there in the field. Uh, it, was, it was regulated based on conductivity of the water. Uh, it was an incredible, I think, engineering feat to put these together and, and have them fully functioning. So I guess the, the only actual difference between these cooling towers and real cooling towers is these were in a, a, a controlled lab environment rather than just sitting outside, I guess would be. That's correct, yes. Now, I, I guess how uh, – yeah, when you know, when we talk about the, uh, the uh, devices and the installation of the devices, you said that the, uh, the companies themselves oversaw the installation of their own uh, non-chemical water treatment device. That's correct. Now, I, I guess, looking across the spectrum of, of, of these devices, were there any devices that were not included in, uh, in this uh, study? The, the intent of the study was to include the major classes of non-chemical devices that are out there on the market today, uh, and that included magnetic device, uh, pulsed electric field device, electrostatic device, uh, ultrasonic device and hydrodynamic cavitation. Those are the major classes of non-chemical devices that are out there today. Okay. And, and when you ran the tests, I guess, how, how long did these tests run? Typically, each experiment for each device ran between four and six weeks. And what happened in between the, 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 each run? Well, in order to be fair to each uh, device, 
there was an elaborate process of cleaning and retooling the cooling tower in between each experiment, which involved uh, removing the fill or the packing, putting new packing in, seasoning that packing, doing a, a, a hyperchlorination disinfection of the tower in between each run uh, to allow the next device to be tested uh, to be on equal footing. Now, you, you said, now that, and I didn't catch this um, kind of in your presentation that you had, uh, you had done to our local chapter, but you, the, the packing itself, the, the fill um, mm-hmm. material, that was not reused? That's correct. It was changed each time. Okay. But uh, and it was standard packing. Um, the, the designation is CF1200. And, and the Project Monitoring Committee really wanted uh, the, the materials in the towers and the functioning of it to be as uh, real life as possible. So that's the, the typical type of packing or fill that's used in a cooling tower. And that had to be changed out in between each run. Now, I guess what what were you looking for when you when you monitored the uh, the uh, 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 test rig? What what were some of the things that you tested for? Because this this uh, series of experiments was to test the ability of these non chemical devices to control microbial fouling in cooling towers or the bacteria that are in them, we tested the bacteria. Um, total bacteria, which many people um, may be familiar with the, the term heterotrophic plate count or HPC bacteria. So that gives you an idea of just bulk bacteria. And we tested both in the, the water, in the tower, or in the sump, so that's called planktonic uh, sampling, but also on the surfaces of biofilm coupons, or we're looking at uh, surface adherence of bacteria. Uh, so that's what was specified in the ASHRAE protocol. Uh, because of my interest in Legionella, I also arranged for testing in our laboratory for Legionella as an aside uh, to the required testing. Okay, uh, so so let me see if this is kind of a, a fair kind of if I if, if I were to boil it down, you're basically testing the sump of the cooling towers. You're testing uh, the, um, the the equivalent fill. Um, by by means of that coupon, so you're you're actually testing the the kind of like the bio slime or the the film uh, on a coupon that would replicate or would be similar to what you'd find on the packing material, correct? Yes, absolutely, and and both are very important in terms of heat transfer. Now, I guess um, t- talking about the uh, the different technologies, um, you know, going into the the actual. Uh, test itself. Um, you said there were uh, there were magnetic, um, pulse electric field. Um, uh, uh, go through the rest of them if you could. Okay, so uh, the the major classes are magnetic, uh, pulsed electric field, electrostatic device, ultrasonic device, and hydrodynamic cavitation. And the majority of these devices do claim, make a claim for microbiological control, but some do not. For example, the, the magnetic device manufacturer doesn't make a claim for microbiological control or fouling control, mostly scale control, but they were interested in having their device tested during the, uh, during the experimentation just in case what was happening in terms of their, uh, their claim for scale control had any impact on the microbiological control. And then the pulsed electric field devices do make a claim for uh, controlling bacteria, and the mechanism of action that's claimed is called encapsulation and electroporation. And they claim that uh, in terms of uh, electroporation, that holes are are created in the bacterial cell wall and encapsulation that that material uh, coats the outside of the bacteria and they fall out of solution. Uh, the electrostatic device um, makes the same type of claim as the pulsed electric field. The ultrasonic de- device uh, makes a claim for microbiological control by something called acoustic cavitation. And essentially what they're saying is that uh, uh, certain types of bubbles are, pr- are produced by the device and that the bursting of those bubbles near bacteria can kill them. And then the last type of device is the hydrodynamic cavitation device. And what that is is uh, the collision of water streams uh, creates a vortices and that that uh, drives out scale and, and that colliding under high pressure 
somehow ruptures bacteria. So those are the devices and the, the mechanisms of action uh, that the device manufacturers claim. Now, if you if you look at the study, you actually we've we've talked about um, those five different uh, means of or the five different technologies that are behind these devices. Um, that actually is the order in which they were tested. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, let's let's start off with the first. Let's let's start off with magnetic. Um, what uh, what uh, I guess in, in going through these devices, you know, if you were to read the study, what what kind of things are important? Uh, to focus on? Well, because this is a, a, essentially a, a, an assessment of the control of bacteria, the study design is pretty straightforward. For each device, um, we just had to verify that the cooling towers were both the, the test cooling tower and the control. So by, side by side, we've got one of the model cooling towers with the test device on it and an exact replica sitting next to it that doesn't have the device on it. And we're sampling uh, twice a week the bulk water, once a week the uh, biofilm coupons uh, for the total bacteria and, and Legionella, and uh, we're comparing to see whether there's any difference between the control without a device and the device. And we ran each one of these devices through the trial, and... Uh, so the most important thing is that the device was operating properly, and that, as I mentioned earlier, was verified by each device manufacturer by coming physically to Pittsburgh and, and uh, overseeing the installation and operation of their device at the start of the experiment. So once they gave it their blessing, then the device manufacturers were no longer involved and they were not privy to the outcome of the experiment. Uh, with each of the devices that was tested, they went on, underwent the same process, and um, the takeaway was that when we did the statistical analysis of the difference between the recovery of bacteria from the test, the tower with the test device, and the tower that was the control, there was no significant difference. And what that means is that we were unable to demonstrate that any of these five devices were capable of controlling uh, the microbial fouling in the cooling tower. Wow. This, I mean, that, that has to have been a surprise to uh, the, the manufacturers that, uh, that participated, I would assume. Um, I think they were hoping for... Um, a different outcome, let's just say. Right. Uh, but what's most important, I think, for your listeners to understand is that this is the very first controlled study of the efficacy of these non-chemical devices in a, you know, a scientific, objective manner. What's out there uh, in terms of, of your listeners being able to evaluate these devices are either anecdotal reports provided by manufacturers or some reports in the literature on field evaluations uh, that really were mostly done by manufacturers. Uh, so uh, this is the only really objective scientific study out there on the efficacy of these devices. Now, I guess what, uh, you know, obviously since we weren't con you weren't controlling, I think one of the th interesting points um, in some of the, uh, the information that you shared was, you know, exactly when did the bacteria show up since it wasn't being controlled? Um, what we found was that uh, as you start the experiment and you put the, the, uh, the makeup water in, and the makeup water was Pittsburgh city water, and one of the things that the ASHRAE committee required of us was that we remove chlorine from that city water. And the reason for that is that the, the committee did not want to have chlorine uh, be a factor in controlling the bacteria in the cooling towers. So the water was passed through a carbon filter and then added to the cooling towers. And both cooling towers had the same makeup water. And that makeup water had between 100 and 1,000 total bacteria in it. That water goes into the towers. And as you know, the operation of cooling towers, it's a heat it's a heat exchange, and so the water warms up. Well, bacteria uh, need warm water to multiply, and within uh, a week, uh, we'd see an increase of, of 100-fold in total bacteria. And it wasn't not, because now, now what, just kind of give a, a, a little, a, a quick um, insight into Legionella. 
because you also tested for that. Yes. Um, while cooling tower operators and manufacturers are mostly concerned with uh, the corrosion that can be associated with uh, increased fouling uh, in a cooling tower or the loss of, of heat transfer efficiency, as a public health microbiologist, I'm very concerned about the potential for the pathogen Legionella to multiply in cooling towers. And while cooling systems are, are you know, water-based cooling systems are energy efficient and if properly treated are very safe, uh, our results uh, suggest that these non-chemical devices alone uh, might not be capable of controlling microbial growth, including Legionella, and, and that's, I think, one of the, one of the most important messages uh, for the users of, of these devices is that you, you can use them safely, but you may need to, to look at or certainly verify whether or not Legionella is under control with whatever treatment you have, whether it's chemical or non-chemical, and the way to do that is to monitor for Legionella. So that's kind of the cautionary tale from my perspective on this study is that you really need to be monitoring not only for total bacteria in your cooling towers, but also for Legionella to assure that you're not amplifying uh, a potential public health concern there. So uh, I guess anybody who has one of these devices uh, installed, uh, might it be prudent to just test to make sure that, you know, in fact they're not, not, not breeding bacteria and Legionella in there? Uh, yes, I think, uh, I think our results suggest that the equipment operators building owners and engineers should monitor these systems uh, that are using non-chemical devices um, and that that monitoring should include total bacteria, which is usually standard operating procedure, but that doesn't tell you the whole story. You have to specifically monitor, take that water sample and test it for Legionella to determine uh, if that organism uh, is under control as well. Now, the two are not related. Many people don't realize that. They think if their if their um, their total plate count or their dip slide is is a hundred, uh, that that means that all bacteria in that tower, including Legionella, are under control, and that and that is not predictive. There is no relationship between total bacteria counts and presence or absence of Legionella. Hmm. Now, I guess what what sort of kickback did you get from the, the manufacturers? Of these devices, I mean, obviously, when they when they heard the results, I'm I'm sure they wouldn't be like, you know, oh, okay, you know, I I guess it must be true. What 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 sort of you know uh, kickback did did uh, the study receive? Um, I think they there was a as you might expect, and the reason the basis for your question is that there was a tremendous pushback on the part of the manufacturers uh, that do claim uh, uh, fouling control and. Um, some of the uh, some of the arguments that occurred at the at the committee level around the way that the uh, experiments were conducted, uh, including uh, complaints about how many bacteria were in the tower, um, our our device was overwhelmed by the number of bacteria, um, uh, things that really are not. Uh, don't have a scientific foundation, and, and in response to that, uh, our group um, provided the, the Project Monitoring Committee with some comparative information about water quality. I think a lot of people don't realize that when you open that warm water tap uh, in your bathroom, uh, there's over a thousand total bacteria, not harmful bacteria for the most part, uh, in that water, and that uh, those numbers are comparable to what we added to the to the makeup of the tower. So there was a lot of discussion, uh, and in fact, I'm aware that some of the manufacturers have posted white papers, uh, you know, putting forth their position that uh, their devices are in fact uh, able to control microbial populations in cooling towers. And um, so I think uh, I would put it on your listeners to be the judge. Uh, consider all the information, uh, both the objective scientific information as well as uh, some of the anecdotes that they may hear, and then um, and then judge for themselves. So now, did the uh, the the ASHRAE uh, committee actually have you try you know using chemical treatment to uh, to uh, uh, kind of do a comparative analysis? Yes, and and I give the project monitoring committee a lot of credit for their foresightedness in this regard. Uh, they wanted to demonstrate that the cooling tower operation 
uh, and the use of sort of a standard uh, biocide regimen would be able to show a significant reduction in the bacterial population in the towers. And in order to do that kind of positive control experiment, they had us uh, shock chlorinate the cooling tower, which is often done uh, in the field. And when we used that approach, we were able to show a two to three log or 100 to 1,000 fold reduction of the total bacteria in the tower. Uh, and what that did was it showed that the operation of the cooling tower with a standard chemical regimen was capable of showing a reduction. Uh, and the reason for that is that because we didn't show a reduction with the non chemical devices, one question could be, well, maybe the tower system was incapable of showing a reduction. Well, this experiment or this series of experiments show that that was not the case, that if standard biocide treatment was used, uh, a significant reduction in the microbial population could be demonstrated. And, uh, and I thank the Project Monitoring Committee for having the the idea to do that experiment, because after everything was said and done, the importance of that I experiment uh, really became significant. Now, I guess the one thing that, you know, speaking about, you know, you know the, the sanitation of it, and um, the one thing in, in looking at uh, or reviewing your presentation on this uh, that I found really interesting is that, um, you know, the, when, you, when, you're, when you're trending the microbial count and the Legionella count um, on the very first test run, you don't see it showing up for quite some time. And then on each subsequent test run, you see it showing up earlier and earlier and earlier until the final run, you actually see it showing up like almost immediately. I mean, so uh, can you explain that sort of phenomenon to? Yes. Um, and I, probably some of your listeners have had experience in the field with this kind of thing. And what it shows is that even though we know that chlorine is an effective biocide, and this is what, what was being used uh, at about 10 parts per million in between each run, uh, there's a limit to the efficacy of chlorination to clean a complex network of uh, pieces and parts. And, and this is true in cooling towers and in water distribution systems. Uh, chlorine is quickly inactivated by organic material, uh, the efficacy of any disinfectant is limited to uh, it's the old contact uh, concentration versus time. You have to get that disinfectant to every part of whatever it is you're trying to disinfect. And when we saw this trend where we do the disinfection in between each experiment and then Legionella or other bacteria would, would recolonize, what that means is that uh, every bacteria in that system is not killed by that hypochlorination. And uh, the takeaway for me, which is uh, something I've learned by disinfecting water distribution systems, is that in order to control microbes, you have to have a residual all the time of that active disinfectant. And that's true in a cooling tower and why slug dosing cooling towers is not as effective as continued presence of a biocide. So our, our test rigs were really mimicking what you see in the field. Wow. Now, uh, speaking about that PowerPoint that I've mentioned, is is there a possibility to to get that uh, to make that available to the listeners? Yes, if a listener would like to get a copy, all they have to do is email me at info at sign specialpathogenslab dot com, and we'll make that available to them. Okay, and I will also kind of uh, put that on the show notes as well. So um, I, I guess uh, if anybody wants to talk to you about this or uh, talk to you about Legionella, I guess that's probably one of your, your favorite topics. Um, yes. How, how, how best uh, would uh, people get a hold of you? Is that the same info at Special Pathogens Lab? Yes, uh, and then if they want to be old-fashioned and actually hear my voice, they can call me at 412 281 Five three three five. Okay, and I will post that as well. So, um, I guess uh, is there is there anything else that you'd like to add before we uh, wrap up here? I don't think so. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity, Matt. I think you're doing uh, the engineering community a tremendous service uh, with what uh, what you're providing, both in this broadcast and others. And I thank you very much. All right. Well, I uh, thank you, Dr. Janet Stout, for joining us today. Um, and uh, I guess we will, uh, we will talk to you again. I hope so. Thank you so much. 
All right, and we're back. Thanks once again to uh, Dr. Janet Stout for uh, taking the time out of her busy schedule to talk with us. I think that's something that's that's very fascinating to me. You know, I mean, to me as an engineer uh, and a commissioning agent, you know, I've seen these devices, I've heard of these devices, um, you know, and, and in some cases, you know, I, I believe that they worked. You know, I mean, if if you know, I've I've had you know, <laughs> truth, truth be told, if you've listened to uh, my uh, my uh, episode with the uh, the dolphin uh, uh, system. Uh, I think I don't. I forget what episode it was, but uh, I've actually you know interviewed and, and and you can you can plainly tell that you know I was a big big proponent based on the information that I had received um, you know from them and from you know some uh, uh, some owners that were uh, you know for, were tried and true, but I think the uh, the major point um, that uh, Doctor Stout had kind of pointed out is that you need to be careful. You need to be aware. Uh, you need to make sure that your, uh, you know, maintenance people are protected and they're not, you know, susceptible to, uh, you know, bacteria, Legionella, uh, things like that. So regardless of what you, uh, um, you know, if, if you as an owner or you as an engineer, you need to make sure that if, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're going to use one of these devices, that you need to make sure that the owner is aware that they should be testing uh, to make sure that uh, they have proper control of their biologicals in their cooling towers. So uh, that is uh, <laughs> that's a game changer. I know I'm going to be writing writing a few more emails uh, to some past clients uh, just based on based on that and kind of pointing them to this direction um, just to make them aware. So that is it for this week. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you listening. Thank you, thank you, whether it be on a train, in a plane, in your car, or in front of your lunch. I appreciate each and every one of you listening. If you like what you hear, if you appreciate it, please spread the word. Uh, the more people that we get to listen to this, uh, the more uh, you know uh, access we can get and the more good stuff uh, we can get from other publications and other uh, information. So spread the word. Do your good deed for the day. As a loyal listener, I know that you're going to share this episode uh, with many people. So with that, I will say I will bid you adieu. If you want to get a hold of me, if you have any suggestions or other comments uh, for the show, you can email me, matt at buildingx.co, or you can follow me on Twitter, matt or at buildingx. So until next time, remember, know what you build share what you know.